Praise God we do. Amen. Amen. I'm so excited to see you all. Um, it's always a privilege to be here. Amen. Especially to, to bring the word. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get right into it. Yes. Um, I'm going to be reading from Nehemiah chapter 4, verses Amen. 6 through 9. Nehemiah chapter 4, verses 6 through 9. While you guys get that, I want to give honor to, to God first and foremost. He deserves all the honor and all the glory. Yes. To my pastor as well, Pastor Maffei, he's been my pastor my whole life. I've been incredibly lucky. Um, so praise God for that. Nehemiah chapter 4, verses 6 through 9. It says, So we built the wall. And the entire wall was joined together up to half its height, for the people had a mind to work. Now it happened when Sanballat, Tobiah, the Arabs, the Ammonites, and the Ashkadites heard that the walls of Jerusalem were being restored and the gaps were being closed, that they became very angry. And all of them conspired together to come and attack Jerusalem and create confusion. Nevertheless, Nevertheless, we made our prayer to, to our God, and because of them, we set a watch against them day and night. I'm also going to quickly go to 16, 16 through 18, and says this. So it was from that time on that half of my servants worked at construction, while the other half held the spears, the shields, the, bow, the bows, and wore armor, and the leaders were behind all the house of Judah. Those who built on the wall and those who carried burdens loaded themselves so that with one hand they worked at construction, and with the other they held a weapon. Every one of the builders had his sword girded at his side as he built, and the other and the one who sounded the trumpet was beside me. A little bit of reading for you guys this morning. Praise God. So God gave me this message today I have entitled The Walls of Self Control. The walls of self control. Repeat that with me, guys. The walls of self-control. Amen. Who needs more self-control today in here? Amen? Who needs more self-control in here? Amen. We're, we're going to pray really quickly. We're going to pray. Let's bow our heads. Lord Jesus, we come before you today, giving you all the honor and all the glory, Lord Jesus. We thank you for the opportunity to be in your house, to be in your presence, Lord Jesus. I just pray that your presence would be here. We invite it in today, Lord Jesus. We invite you to take a hold today, Lord Jesus, to take a hold of this service, to take a hold of our hearts, our minds, and our souls, Lord Jesus. In the name of Jesus, I bind every spirit, Lord Jesus, that would seek to distract, Lord Jesus. I bind every spirit, Lord Jesus, that would seek to destroy. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. You may take your seats. So self-control. What is self-control? I think it's self-explanatory, right? Hopefully. But it's being able to control yourself, right? Being able to control Typically, we see it as controlling your, your actions first, right? your actions and your words. Um, but let's take a little bit deeper than that. Self-control should be the ability to control every aspect of your being, yes. including your thoughts. Yes. Can you guys control your thoughts? No. We need to be able to control our thoughts, the voices, the voices we listen to, yes. and our desires. Amen? So... We all know that, that self-control is a fruit of the Spirit. Galatians 5, 22 to 23, sorry, says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. That means that self-control is a product of the Spirit. Amen? If we are filled with the Spirit, we have self-control. Amen? Amen? But we need to exercise that continuously, continuously, continuously. We need to put it into practice. Why? Because if we can't control ourselves, that means something else is getting control of us. Okay? If you can't control yourself, that means something else is controlling you. I hope that that might uh, wake you up a little bit. Because it sure did me. So, what is happening here in, in Nehemiah chapters 2 through 6, right? So it's this whole story, about four chapters, and it says, or... It's, it's Nehemiah, and, and God tasked him with, with rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem. Um, and I think all of the youth should know this story by now, because that's where we got our theme from, right? Go and build. Nehemiah chapter 2. So Nehemiah gathered the Jews, the priests, the nobles, the officials, 
and others to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. But while they rebuilt, enemies planned to attack. Okay? They planned to attack and stop the construction. Why? Because they're God's people. Everyone's against them. So the first attack, we see that, uh, that they had planned to go and rebuild, but, um, but they were attacked not so, you could say, uh, so aggressively, right? In Nehemiah chapter 2, verses 19 through 20, it says, But when Sanballat the Horonite, Tobiah the Ammonite, and uh, Geshem the Arab heard of it, they laughed at us and despised us and said, What is this thing you are doing? Will you rebel against the king? So I answered them and said to them, The God of heaven himself will prosper us. Therefore we, his servants, will arise and build. But you have no heritage or right in Jerusalem. So this is Nehemiah talking to his enemies. He says this. He says, you have no heritage or right in Jerusalem. He just says it straight up. I love that. And you see, when you start to fulfill your calling, like Nehemiah was, when he started to go and get ready to build, right? Yeah. Um, people are going to oppose you. Yes. You're going to see opposition. Yes. Because that's just what the enemy does. That's what he's here for. Kill, steal, and destroy, man. So we see that they laughed at him and despised them. They despised the Jews because they were going to go and rebuild this, this old city. The walls of the city. And, and, and they were questioned for doing what the Lord had called them to do. See, people don't understand a calling of the Lord if they're not with the Lord. How are they supposed to understand that? Yeah. What are you doing? You're going to church? You know? It's, 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 it's very unusual to them at times. But what is so powerful is the response of Nehemiah. He gets questioned and made fun of. How many of you guys have ever been made fun of or questioned? Right. Why are you doing that? Yeah, yeah. What are you doing? Right? That's what happened to Nehemiah. And the first thing he tells his enemies is that the God of heaven himself will prosper us. Yes. Let's do it. See, we, we, we get caught up trying to justify ourselves, amen? Yeah. If someone makes fun of us, we might try to retaliate. What'd you say about me? Yeah, yeah. Right? Amen? Am I the only person who's done that? Praise okay. God. Right? Someone makes fun of us. What'd you say? I'm doing this because of that. And we get all angry and riled up. We, we want to justify ourselves. Yeah. But what did Nehemiah do? He said, the God of heaven himself will prosper. Yes. He didn't go out and attack. He didn't get mad. He didn't try to justify himself. He used God as his reason. Amen. He used God as his reason. Amen. So that is what we must do. And we see that, uh, sorry, he was, he was attacked and called out. But, um, uh, he calls them out, right? He says, you guys don't even have heritage here. People will call you out and make fun of you for, for doing what the Lord has called you to do, but they, don't, they haven't even fulfilled their calling yet. They're not even in their calling. Hallelujah. And we try, to, we try to justify ourselves and get distracted with them. Wow. Are you trying to get distracted with someone else who's already distracted? Are you going to let them stray you away from your purpose? Right? Because Nehemiah did. He simply told them, you have no heritage here. And um, later we see that the true test of Nehemiah's self-control was when they were planning to attack, when they were even closer. They were there. They were ready. Amen? We see in Nehemiah 4, 7 through 9, it says, Now it happened when Sanballat, Tobiah, the Arabs, and the Ammonites, and the Ashdodites heard that the walls of Jerusalem were being restored, and that the gaps were beginning to be closed. I want you to picture this in your mind. There's huge walls, and all of a sudden, little by little, these gaps are being closed. They're getting more and more secure with God. Wow. Amen? We need to do that continuously. We need to rebuild our walls that are already there. Yeah. We need to continuously get stronger and more secure with God. And it says the gaps were beginning to be closed, um, and they became very angry. And all of them conspired together to come and attack Jerusalem and create confusion. See, so not just attack, but create confusion as well. Confusion will be a lingering attack, right? If you get confused about why you're at church, about what your purpose is, about your sexuality, about, about anything, 
that'll, that'll, that'll get you to stay a little bit more away from God because you're confused. Now you have to figure something out yourself. Now you have to figure it out. Well, what's really in me? What do I really need to do? Amen? That's what the enemy seeks to do is create confusion in the church. Nevertheless, we made our prayer to our God. Yes. And because of them, we set a watch against them day and night. See, all these enemies at once, right? It wasn't just one enemy. It was all these enemies surrounding him out of the blue. And they began to surround Jerusalem. But what did Nehemiah do? He said, nevertheless, we made our prayer to God. Yes. Think about that word, nevertheless. It means no matter what happens, I'm going to pray. Yeah. See, before they attacked, before the enemies attacked them, Nehemiah and the Jews prayed. Before they allowed themselves to get distracted, they prayed. Wow. That's good. Praise God. And they set a watch against them, right? Yes. What does that mean? I'm not telling you guys to let your guard down and just let the enemies come close and attack you and do whatever they want with you. No, I'm saying to not let your situation distract you from your relationship with God. Don't let your circumstance determine your relationship. Yeah. Right? We're... Pastor Anthony Rome will talk about that. We get too caught up in our feelings, amen? If your situation determines your relationship with God, then your relationship is always like this. Because we go through ups and downs in life, amen? We go through ups and downs, we're happy, we're sad. And if this is your relationship with God, and all of a sudden it's like this, what? what's going to happen? We might not end up in heaven, amen? Yeah. Those are the stakes. Those are the stakes that we're talking about today. If I only worship God when I wasn't going through something, if I only prayed to God when my life was nice and quiet and peaceful, if I let the enemy decide when I would spend time with him, my relationship wouldn't exist. Yeah. And that is why self-control is imperative. That's why I'm talking today about self-control, because yeah. that'll counteract what the enemy tries to do. Amen? Can I get an amen in here? Amen. I'll preach to myself, that's all right. Can I get an amen in here? Amen. So, God is not going to allow us to be tempted beyond our ability. Amen? Yeah. It says in 1 Corinthians 10.13, No temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able but with the temptation, will also make a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. Yeah. See, we like to blame God for our situation, but he's already made a way out for you. Yeah. We like to get caught up in, oh, I'm not going to go to church today. It was too busy, too hectic last week. He made a way for you. You just didn't pray. Wow. That's good. Amen? God is not going to allow you to be tempted beyond your ability. But that means that he's testing us. He's waiting for us. He's looking at us. He's observing. He's, are you going to pick up my word today? Are you going to fast this week? Are you going to go pick up your cross today? Are you going to get down on your knees and pray? Or are you going to go and give in to the temptation of comfort? You see, comfort is a temptation. If we stop pushing, we stop growing. And if we're not growing, what's, what's happening, guys? If we're not growing, right? We're decreasing in our relationship with God. That's what comfort does to you. So you, you guys can sit there. It's nice. It's a nice pew. I understand. <laughs> you guys can sit there. But what would happen if we worshipped? What would happen if we got up and we told God, I don't want to be comfortable today? What would happen if we got up and we jumped a little bit and we said, you know what, God? I want to worship you no matter my situation. I'm going to worship you no matter how I feel. I'm going to worship you no matter what I'm going through because I have self-control. And my self-control tells me that I can worship what I want. That I know who you are, God. That I can worship you the way I want. That I can pray when I need to. Amen? We need to pray when we feel to pray. We get called so much to pray. Oh my gosh, all the callings to pray that I've missed. Yes. I'm going to be honest with you. I've missed so many of those. Yeah. God has said, please pray for that person. Yeah. I won't do it, but someone else will. Wow. You see, we need to continuously move forward yes. to press on. Yes. So I want to talk about Nehemiah's decision when the enemies were close. 
we see later in chapter 4 that the Jews started rebuilding. Amen? They started to rebuild, but, but they started to doubt in their God. Again, they started to doubt in their God, and they believed instead that the enemy was going to surround them, right? Instead of focusing on God, they focused on the enemy. Imagine being one of those Jews. Yeah. I'm not saying it's easy to always test your self-control, but I'm saying it's necessary. Yes. Imagine being one of those Jews, and you hear that armies are surrounding you, and they're going to be here soon. What would you do? You, would, you, would you just keep rebuilding a wall? Let's be honest with ourselves. Would, would I just keep rebuilding this wall that, that God told Nehemiah to do? He didn't tell me. He told the man of God. Yeah. Right? I would be tempted. Amen? I would be tempted to run away. I would be tempted to get my sword and fight. Do something. I wouldn't want to rebuild the wall if I was one of those Jews. Yeah. Right? But that's what they did. Even though they were tempted to, to give in to, to the enemy's intimidation, they kept staying in their purpose. They focused on what God had called them to do. Imagine what they must have been saying to Nehemiah, though. Please, let us run away. Let us fight. Let us do this. Let us do that. Anything but put this brick on this brick. It seems pointless, right? Sometimes what God calls you to do, it might seem pointless. Why? Because we don't have God's understanding. We don't have God's knowledge. And sometimes it's just so outside of our realm of, of understanding that it seems, why am I doing this? Why am I here today? Because he has a purpose, amen? How many of you leaders in here know that when it's, a time, when it's time to make a decision about something important, all of a sudden all these opinions flood you? All of a sudden people will open their mouths that haven't been talking all year about church and now they want a say, right? It's like, what? When, where did this come from? Yeah. Right? Think about what Nehemiah was going through. He, he told these people to build, and then the enemies are surrounding, and they're, they're trying to get out of there. So God's calling grew less important to the Jews just because the enemy got a little closer. God. See, the enemy got a little closer to them, and they're like, oh, maybe this isn't as important as I thought it was. Amen? Who has that happened to? Amen? Does God's calling seem less important sometimes? See, so what I'm telling you is don't let the enemy's position influence your work for God. Just because the enemy's close, it doesn't mean that you stop building. Just because the enemy might scare you a little bit, it doesn't mean that you get to walk away from what God has called you to do. That is what we are called to do, amen? When he gets close, you keep pushing. When he gets close, you keep pushing. You keep building. Why? Because he wants you to stop. That's the whole point. So Nehemiah was faced with an incoming enemy. And he says this in 16 through 18. It says, So it was from that time on that half of my servants worked at construction, while the other half held spears, the shields, the bows, and wore armor. Okay? And the leaders were behind all the house of Judah. Those who built on the wall and those who carried burdens loaded themselves so that with one hand they worked at construction, right? With one hand they were putting the bricks on and with the other they held a weapon. Think about that. They were ready to fight, but they didn't. They kept building, but they were prepared for when the enemy would attack. Every one of the builders had his sword girded at his side as he built, right? Like a, like in today's world, it would be like a gun at his holster, right? And the one who sounded the trumpet was beside me. So he had them, Nehemiah had them continue to rebuild. He had them equipped with the weapons. Now imagine soldiers building, guys that were trained to do this, to do that, to fight, and then they get told to build. Sometimes what we are prepared to do is not what God wants us to do in that moment. And then he equipped them with a weapon. Soldiers building. Are we not God's, God's army? Amen? Amen? We're called to fight, but we're also called to build. Yeah. You see, there's a dual purpose, and we have to know when to balance them. Amen? Now, look at verse 18. It says, Every one of the builders had a sword girded at his side. So they were building, but they were prepared to use the sword. 
They had everything that they needed to go and fight. The temptation to fight was there, or to flee was there, right? The, temp the temptation to flee. And I'm sure that they stayed at their post and built, right? Amen. They just stayed there and they were building. They're, oh my gosh, they're coming closer, but I just got to finish this. They probably hurried up, right? I probably would have too. I would have been like, man, I need to get these bricks on there, man. Now I want to talk about that sword. They had swords ready just in case. Now, do you know what the Bible compares to a sword? It compares the Bible to a sword. In Hebrews 4.12, it says, For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Hold that Bible up, Brother Rafa. I want you guys to think about this. That is our weapon. Amen? We must be ready to use that at all times. Thank you, brother. The word is our defense. The word is our defense. Amen? But we can't use a weapon that we don't have. We can't use a weapon that we don't have, and that's why we need to read daily. Yes. We need to read, church. Amen? In Matthew 4, we see one of the greatest examples of using the word as a weapon. We see Jesus himself, right? The devil was tempting him. He says in Matthew 4, 3-4, Now the tempter came to him. He said, If you are the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. But he answered and said, It is written, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. When Jesus was tempted, he used the word as his support for self-control. Amen? We need that self-control. Amen? Amen? How many of you guys have ever lost your self-control? Yeah. Let's get real, church. Yeah. How many of you guys have ever lost self-control? Yeah. It's not a good feeling after, right? No. You realize what happened. Wow, I let that get a hold of me. Yeah. And I think we all have regrets yeah. of when we should have made a better decision. Yeah. Yeah. That's why, I believe that's why God told me to tell you this. Is because we need that before we grow. Amen. We need the self-control to build. Yes. Because right now is a time of distraction. Wow. We're in a time of distraction where the enemy is coming close. And you guys feel it. Yeah, yeah. Amen? You guys have been attacked. How easy is it to get distracted without self-control? Yeah, yeah. Amen? How easy is it to forget about your purpose? Wow. And we get that self-control from the word. Amen? God has given us a direct weapon to use. Yes. We're going to try to fight the enemy with our own words, with our own will. No, I'm not going to do that today. No, I'm not going to get angry. You are going to get angry if you're not depending on God. Amen? Amen. You are going to get angry if you're not reading the word. If you're not getting wisdom, you're getting something else. And you become that much easier for the enemy to distract you. Amen? Right. We need that word. To help us rebuild our walls. We need to continuously rebuild. And rebuild. And rebuild. Because the enemy is continuously attacking. Yeah. Amen. Please stand with me. As I conclude. Finally, in, in chapter 6, we see that the wall has been completed. The wall is done. In, in 15 through 16, it says, So the wall was finished on the 25th day of Elul in 52 days and it happened when our enemies heard of it and all the nations around us saw these things that they were very disheartened in their own eyes for they perceived that this work was done by our God Amen, Amen. when the enemies see God's calling fulfilled they know that it was God yeah. what would happen if we didn't get distracted what would happen if we didn't give in tonight, tomorrow, next week? What would happen if we continued to rely on God and prayed for that self-control, amen? Yes. We need more of that in our lives, amen? Yes. We need to rely on God for that, not on ourselves. Yes. Not on ourselves. Yes. If we rely on ourselves, we're going to give in. Yes. Trust me, trust me, I know. So they saw it as a work of God. 
In Proverbs 25, 28, it says, Whoever has no rule over his own spirit is like a city broken down without walls. You guys think it's a coincidence that the word is alluding to the word? It's not a coincidence. Whoever has no rule over his spirit is like a city broken down without walls. I don't know about you, but I don't want to be defenseless today, amen? I don't know about you, but I don't want to rely on myself. I feel that we've been relying on ourselves too much, church. Part of that is trust. We need to learn to trust in God today, amen? And it's hard. It's a test. But we need to. Without our walls, we are defenseless. Some of you guys are probably thinking about times where you were defenseless and you just had no choice. The enemy came and what could you do? You weren't prepared for that, amen? Yeah. Don't let your guard down. And pray for the fruits of the Spirit every day. Yeah. Every day, pray the fruits of the Spirit over your life. Pray for self-control and exercise this fruit, amen? Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to call you guys up today so that we can pray for this.